Oh. Running. Yes. Goody. Hi, everyone. Sorry for being a few minutes late. Yeah, we have some time, right? So we can stretch it a bit. Also, you voted to see the extra string matching algorithms. So uh, uh, we'll probably have some, some part at the end that you may or may not need for the uh, for this exam. Um, I brought a few books. Uh, this one I should have brought long ago. That's the algorithms book, Cedric and Wayne, that unit two and three took parts from. And a small part of this unit is also in there. And then there are a few more um, math books that are more on the on the proof technique and discrete math side. Because a few people asked about this. Um, <laughs> so the top question here is about more more practice questions. Um, the thing is, I can I can give you more practice questions, but you have to be more specific. What exact topic? Like, uh, I can give you two books if you ask about all of mathematics and the cost of algorithms. That's a bit too broad. So I think you you want to get to some specific questions or a specific material from the lecture and see how far you get with that, and then ask more specific. I'll point you to the generic books, and you have a peek at that. But uh, they're too much. You can't cover all of the books uh, in the time, and you don't need them to pass this module. It's a bit tricky to answer otherwise. And I think that there are a few other questions that go in the same direction. Um, that one's specific to the mathematics part of the module. But again, that's a bit broad. Uh, we have analysis. We have proving limits. We have uh, proof techniques. We have induction. And we have maybe a general set notation uh, for the obvious ones. Maybe be a bit more specific. Um, I can give you better better recommendations. Uh, the two I brought here, just to, if you're just in the live stream, there are. Uh, this is a new one that I got. It's called Connecting Discrete Mathematics and Computer Science. There are many discrete math books for first year undergrads in computer science that are suitable for catching up on on some discrete math. You don't need all of this. Uh, that's, that's a book that tries to make the connection to computer science applications of the discrete math parts. There are many good books on discrete math, but some don't make the reason so clear why, you, why we study a certain topic as part of computer science. And this book tries to do that exactly well. And then the proof techniques, there's the how to prove it. That one's linked on the website. Uh, maybe I should link the green one as well. Um, I don't know it so well, so uh, I've only s uh, skimmed it a little bit. So um, I, I hope it explains things well. Um, okay, I don't want to go through all the questions at the beginning. Uh, is that from this time? Maybe I can yank up the volume a bit. Is that loud enough? Okay. Uh, maybe Valid, you can say which feedback you're looking after. Is this class tests or the continue the, the programming puzzles? I don't know if you can edit the question or something like that, or just post it again. I mean, in both cases, the class tests, you, I, I try to get the, my grads, the, the grades posted once in a while. Um, but it, it can't be automated without sending this confusing email. Uh, whereas for the other ones, um, we don't really have the capacity to mark everything twice Okay, for the programming puzzles. Uh, the, we won't have the capacity to mark everything twice. So I don't think we can really offer that. This question is well covered on the website. Please read the website about the assessment. I don't want to repeat it. Um, 
that one's more specific about the, the reports. Um, it should be one report for all. So you have to split up the, the space for the different plots. But the hope is that you have an approach that's more general than uh, one specific plot. So you can probably cover things together. Uh, this maybe you can also be more specific what uh, what's meant. Do you want more class tests or just more quizzes like the class tests? Then the question would be um, what's the what's the benefit of having those? Just uh, something auto marked where you get get feedback. Uh, I mean, you can do that for yourself, right? Um, you don't need, really need me to force you to do a class test for doing that. You can take any of the algorithms that we cover, invent some fictitious input and run the algorithm on it. And you can ask classmates to check if they come to the same conclusion. <laughs> Please read before you click on the class tests. Uh, if there's a technical problem, you can email me. I'm looking at seven at the moment, seven class tests. Uh, okay. So let's start for now. Uh, you haven't caught it yet. Here's the attendance code. And Then we should talk about string matching again. Uh, let me briefly recap uh, just the, the definition. We started unit four last time uh, with some, some formal uh, notation for, for strings and string matching. And just because this pops up all the time, I want to uh, repeat it so that we're on the same page. So uh, we have the, a text T of length N, we have a pattern P of length M, and we're trying to find if there's a, a position in the text where uh, this occurs. Why do I have a black, black dot and not my, my normal one? Ah, there we go. Uh, so we're trying to find the pattern in the text if it occurs. If so, we want to report the first occurrence. So we report an index, the starting index, or the, the index where the first character of our pattern occurs in the text. And if there are several occurrences, we want to find the earliest one. Or we return the special no match. And then we had a few examples. Uh, we also covered our uh, first algorithm to do that, the brute force algorithm that basically goes for every, every possible place where the pattern could be located in principle and just checks character by character. Uh, but it was at least smart enough once it found one mismatch to stop the search and move to the next, next guess. So that it sometimes doesn't use as much uh, character comparisons, but in the worst case, we had this, this kind of behavior n times m. So what we'll look at next is ways to do smart, to do better than the brute force method, in particular uh, in ways that are more robust. The brute force method, I said, often works fine, but in the worst case, it doesn't. And so to get the worst case right, uh, we have to use different ideas. In the next section, we'll look at string matching using uh, finite automata, or uh, DFAs eventually, of different, different such things. Uh, if you've had some undergrad class in automata theory, some of the things will, uh, will be familiar. Um, but it's not often discussed as an application of all that theory. I think it's a nice way to motivate that. So just to see uh, where people stand on this. I won't rely on this much, and I could already 
make a prediction how this will how this will pan out. Probably the two thirds who do advanced computer science um, have seen at least part of this, and the other third might not have seen much of it. So it's the same old problem. I can't really rely on everyone knowing it. Um, but in this case, I don't think it's repetition, so I'll, I'll just go through it. Maybe there's a way. OK, if I remember correctly, we had a few more people vote for the attendance code, 128. But most people have cast their vote. This is not, not so important. So many, many haven't heard about this. Um, and then the others are split between, OK, I've, I've heard this before, but I don't really remember so much. Um, plus a few others. <laughs> so in this case, we don't really need to know any about this. It just makes connecting the dots a little nicer for those of you who know it. Uh, but you can follow the part that I present either way. For those who know it, uh, the short solution for string matching really should be we try to find the pattern somewhere in the text. That's to say, we try to represent the text as the pattern plus some string of arbitrary length before it and some other string of arbitrary length, arbitrary length before and after the pattern, after the pattern and before the pattern. Uh, and because it's sigma star, both can be empty. So it's fine if the pattern occurs right at the beginning and so on. That's just a, a different way to phrase the problem. Now I've uh, I've lost in this, uh, for the moment, the restriction that we want to find the first occurrence of the pattern. Um, that's a bit more tricky to express, if, but you can, can still try. But we won't, we won't have to worry about this. Um, the automata theory or formal language theory part here would say, ah, this is a regular expression or regular uh, language. Uh, it's recognized by a regular expression. Uh, and so that means we know that's basically automata or formal languages theory. There is a thing called a deterministic finite automaton. I'll show you what these are that recognizes this. And so we can feed the text through this in exactly n steps, as many steps as the text has characters. Not n times m or anything like that, right? Just n steps once we have the automaton. And uh, that automaton should be able to decide if the text is of this form, which means it contains the pattern, or not. So that's, that's good. Um, a theoretician might say, OK, cool, that's all I need. Um, but maybe not. Uh, there's a few things that are open. First of all, maybe you don't know all this stuff, then it doesn't help, but you can learn about it. More seriously, though, <laughs> uh, this would only tell us there exists a pattern, but it doesn't tell us where it is. Uh, it only exists, it says there is some occurrence of the pattern. It doesn't tell us where. Um, and also, who knows, like this automaton, that's an existence. That just says there is some, but maybe it's absurdly big and it's just beyond practical. Uh, and both of these problems could be very real. Now, it turns out they both aren't really a problem, but uh, you want to look inside the black box to see that that indeed is the case. So uh, let's first go over what an automaton is. For us, we can basically think of it as a diagram like this. Uh, we have states. These are the, the circles. 
Uh, I just numbered them. They can have other names if it's convenient, uh, but this doesn't matter. It's some set of states, and we will use the numbers because they have some meaning in our case, but that's uh, up, up to us. Uh, and we also need uh, an alphabet associated for such an automaton. That's the type of letters that can occur on these edges. Um, we also need a start state, so that's usually just shown by a little arrow coming out of nowhere. That means you have to start in state zero initially. There are these double line states. These are accepting states. Uh, that has a meaning in the formal language sense. For us, it, it will just mean, okay, we found a pattern. That's kind of the success moment. And then there's all these arcs which tell you, ah, if you're here and you see as the next character an A, you should follow that arc and go to state one. Now, more formally, people often write this, uh, instead of drawing this, this picture, you can um, specify the so-called transition function. And I'll always use delta for that. That's a function that maps from the states. So Q is the set of states. Sigma is the alphabet that we use. It maps from a pair of states and the next character that we read to a new state. So for example, here, the edge I just showed you, when we are in state five and we read an A, we go to state one. Okay? So you can either give the automaton by specifying this transition function plus all the other information. You need to say what the start state is and what the alphabet is. Uh, this, the transition function you can give as a table, then it's kind of implicit we can say the, the states, okay, let me try to squeeze this here. You can have the states up here. And we can have the letters as the rows. And then you can try to fill that table. And I'm not going to do it because it's too many, many steps. I'll bore you to death. But uh, the entry for 5 and A should be a 1. That's that entry here. Okay, so you can either give the table or you can give that drawing. Uh, we don't need to, um, to be overly formal on this. Now, there's one important bit that I didn't talk about yet, and that's the word deterministic. Deterministic means there shouldn't be any ambiguity or any chance. Now, where, where could there be ambiguity? If you look at the transition function, the way it's called a function means for every pair of states uh, and symbol, there can be exactly one state, and also uh, there has to be one. So if you draw the table, that's kind of obvious, but in the picture, you could have several outgoing arcs with the same letter, or there could be letters missing. So deterministic just means exactly one arc for each pair. of a state and uh, a character. OK, so what does all of that have to do with uh, string matching? What I'll promise you on this slide, and we'll come to how to get there, is that this, this automaton that's drawn here is capable of helping to recognize texts that contain this pattern P. OK. First obvious thing to note, if you look at the pattern, you find the pattern here, A, B, A, B, A, C, A. If you just follow the edges that go left to right, you find the pattern again. So at least it occurs in some sense in the automaton. That's reassuring, right? Um, the way this automaton works now is hopefully very intuitive. You initially start in the start state. You always are in one state. And then you just do what the uh, arcs tell you to do by reading through the text. So you're initially in state 0. Then if you read through the text, 
the first thing you find is an A. So you're in state zero, you read an, an A that takes you to state one. So I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to do this for all of the letters, otherwise we'll get in a very messy picture. I'll just draw it for one, one transition. Now we're in state one and we read another A. The arc there takes us back to state one. And that's all that you do. Now, if you ever reach that state seven while you're doing this, you found, a, found an occurrence. And uh, the more, that's kind of obvious because we just followed these, these green edges. The more interesting statement is that if you do not end up in state seven, then there's no match up to this point. Uh, and we'll get back to that. Uh, let's complete the table just uh, to finish this off. So we're in state one still. We read a B that brings us to state two. We're in state two. We read an A this time. The next, so I'm, I'm just going through the characters of the text, right? This is the text written down again. So from state two, reading an A brings us to state three. From state three, reading a C, all the way back to zero. All right. Zero, reading an A brings us to one. One reading an A brings us back to one. One reading a B advances us to two. Now we see another A that brings us to three. We've been there before, but this time we see a B, which gets us further to state four. From four, we read an A, gets us to five. And then we read a C and then an A. So you get to six and then <coughs> seven. And so that means ending with the current letter with the one that we've just read, there's an occurrence of the pattern. So from here down to, um, well, the length of the pattern back, we have A, B, A, B, A, C, A. That's our pattern, OK? And for string matching, we would now return that we basically found a match starting at this position. So that's, that's the connection between those two. And uh, here's the same information without the messy drawings. <laughs> now, um, you could spell this out in code, and you find detailed code in the book if you, if you want to look that up. Um, now, the code can't use these kind of diagrams, but it can use a transition function and variables. And so you maintain the current state. You read the next character. You take the transition table to tell you what the next state is that you go to. You just keep going like this, each time checking if you reach the final state. So the code for that is not hard. And uh, each step just takes you, um, so uh, each letter of the text just means one, one lookup of, of the next state and potentially a check for the final state. That's very cheap, right? Uh, so let's also write that down. We read at most each text character once. And you should compare this to the brute force method, which in the worst case needed n times m. Right? If m is a, a few hundreds or thousands of characters long, it's, it's quite a reduction. Now, of course, uh, this all hinges on someone telling you what this automaton is. And uh, let me also tell you, if you just, just took the, 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 the arcs that go left to right and don't pay attention to those going back, then you can miss occurrences. So you, you can't always just jump back to zero, for example. So what we're still missing is a way to uh, build that automaton. But if we have it, we have a good string matching algorithm. Now, um, to build our way towards this, uh, let's first understand the automaton more and then worry about how to compute it efficiently. And the, the main insight is to give the states a specific meaning. And once you internalize that, much of the rest falls kind of into place. So that's, that's the, a, an important bit to um, to pay close attention to. Uh, the intuition is that if you're in state Q, 
That means you've read some part of the text, fine. Um, so you may have seen the text up to this point, and it may continue, but at this point, you've seen a certain part of the pattern, a certain prefix of the pattern. So maybe the pattern can look like this. And you've seen up to here a certain prefix of the pattern in the sense that if this is P and this is the text, then these characters are all matches, so they're all the same. OK, you always have seen a prefix of the pattern if the prefix can be empty, right? So this is not saying anything. You can always find a Q so that this is true if you set Q to zero, for example. But the point here is that it has to be the longest such. So there's no way to put P further to the left and also get, get matches all the way across. So this means somewhere along the way here you have a mismatch, you have a character that doesn't match. If, if you're in state Q, it means the length of this thing is Q. And whenever you shift the pattern further inwards to the text, giving you more matched characters, something goes wrong at some point. One of the characters is mismatched. Okay, so we've, we've seen the prefix of the pattern and that's the longest we've seen so far. Um, okay. Now, uh, you may wonder if we take a step back, uh, how is it even possible to have a, a single automaton that works for all texts? Now, we still have to read the text, but uh, how can it be that we can find occurrences in the text if all we build the automaton on is the pattern? And um, the reason to see that that's enough information, that all the information you need is, is this prefix of the pattern you've seen so far, is the next step, read about, read the next character and see what can happen. So if, we, um, if we're in a certain state Q and we now read a character C from the text, we don't know what that is. The text could be anything. Um, so one, one letter C comes. So um, there's two options. It could be the next character of the pattern. Then we just go to the next arc. So if we're in this state, then we've seen the first three characters of P and not more. If we now see a B, then we've seen now the first four characters of P, and that's, that's the easy case. If, if we have a, a non-match, so there's not the right character coming, what can we say? Well, we've seen so much of the text. Let me draw this again to not clutter it up too much. So the text may continue. In particular, it continues one further letter with C. And we're in this, in this state, we've seen up to here. Uh, let me draw it so I can draw the green things in between. This is the pattern. And then we had matches up to that position, but then a mismatch with C. And this here is the first Q characters. That's the situation we're in. And now the argument is, all we need to know is in this prefix of P. It doesn't matter what the text looks like before that occurrence. So everything that's before that occurrence is irrelevant from the text. And the reason for that is that we picked the longest prefix. If C is a mismatch, then uh, we have to shift P further to the right to get a match again. If there was a way to shift P to the left, then chopping off that last character would give us a longer than the longest prefix. And that's a contradiction.
So what we can find is some, some Q prime as shown in this picture here. All right, let me draw it again so that you can shift the pattern a bit further. And now you can get alignment up to this point of all the characters here, including the C. And we already know this Q prime must be at least one, long, one shorter than Q. It, it must be strictly less. Otherwise, we would get a contradiction to this longest prefix from previously. So that's why such an automaton is even possible. All you need to do the next step to maintain this invariant that you're in a state that stores what's the longest bit of the pattern that I've seen so far in the text ending here. All you need for that is in that prefix itself. So the automaton can work for any text. Now, um, this, this kind of argument is also the, the correctness proof of the string matching procedure. Um, that's what I alluded to earlier when I said, when we were discussing this example, the, the, import, the easy bit is that when you reach the state 7, the accepting state that you found a, a pattern occurrence because you just walked along this, this path, uh, the tr more tricky bit is to argue that if, if you're not here, then you have not found one. So what you would have to do is um, proof by induction that this invariant is always maintained. And because it's the longest prefix of P that we've seen up to this point, if all the way through the text you never reach up to state M, the length of the pattern, then you've never seen the entire pattern. Uh, this, this part is a little less intuitive to explain. I think um, you have to go through this invariant. Is there a question? A letter B? Um, uh, are you in this example? Uh, so uh, a letter B at the end of the text or at the end of the pattern? So another B at the end here? Um, so uh, as you see in the picture, the way the automaton is drawn here, it would just stay in that state 7 forever. Uh, so what this arc with sigma means is it stays there no matter what comes. Uh, we don't really use the automaton like this because the first time we reach that state, we will just immediately return. Um, you could modify the automaton to keep going so that you can keep, keep reading through the text. That's a small modification. Now, so in this example, it means whatever comes, you will always stay in state 7. I'm not sure if that is your actual question. Uh, in, in this, that's kind of a, a boring answer. Um, I think you'll, you'll look at this in one of the tutorial problems as well. Uh, you can just extend the construction for the automaton to the last state, and then you get the matches, the, the, the edges that you would need for the mismatching characters there. So uh, you, you can extend the automaton so that it keeps reading, and it just flies by this accepting state whenever there's an occurrence. Um, that's maybe worth, worth noting down. We might... Um, I comment on this in, the, in a later unit on, on, on the parallel problems. But because we discussed it anyways, let me write it down briefly.
keep keep finding other cracks. So what this getting at is the D of A can find all occurrences. And essentially the same time, it can just uh, tell you once it found one. Um, I think the, co the, the book has detailed code for that part, finding all occurrences. We'll at least get to it in the context of the KMP algorithm. Um, if you're, if you're very keen, maybe uh, ping me on Campus Wire. The, the changes are not too hard. Um, but maybe if you're seeing it the first time, that's, that's not quite true. Other questions before we move on? There was one question on Campus Wire. Uh, sorry, on none. Slido, I'm mixing up my tools. Yeah. Uh, so the the DFA in our sense is is robust in this sense. So you 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 can't fool it in some sense. Um, what would fool mean? I mean, it it knows what state could to go to in every in every possible instance. Uh, there's potentially a catch if. Uh, if you feed it a symbol that's not in its alphabet, it doesn't really know what to do. Uh, and it would kind of say, okay, I'm, I'm, I wasn't built to read a symbol like this. When you build the automaton, you have to specify the allowed alphabet symbols. Uh, I mean, that said, <laughs> if, you, if you're trying to find a pattern that contains the letters A, B, C, and your text contains a letter D, I guess you can always just jump back to zero because there's no overlapping occurrence with a letter that doesn't occur in the pattern at all. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. So I think uh, it's foolproof in that sense. Um, or robust. All right, let's see um, how we construct these automata, now that we know how to use them. In the next section, we'll look at how to construct these string matching automata that work so well for finding the occurrences of a pattern in the text. And again, um, for those who've had some automata theory, have been uh, tortured with a bit of that in some, some previous lecture, Maybe you know about NFAs. If DFA stands for deterministic finite automaton, then NFA might stand for non-deterministic finite automaton. Um, and it does. Uh, these are all kinds of automata that are not deterministic. It's kind of a, it doesn't really say what they are. Um, it just means that they can leave some parts up to ambiguity. And um, in a way, the easy part to build this, this string matching automaton was just writing down the pattern on edges to the right and leaving the automaton as it is. If you additionally allow the automaton to stay in state zero for all letters, you've actually built um, a valid non-deterministic automaton for this, for this language sigma star p sigma star. It's kind of not so useful algorithmically, but it will help in an indirect way. Um, I just want to point out for those who haven't used these automaton, the way, the way they're um, reading an input now means when I start in state zero, even if I read an A, I don't have to go to state one. I can also decide, ah, this time I'd actually rather stay in state zero. And then, Reaching the final state means there's some way to choose among these options that gets you there. Or another way to put the same is instead of being in a single state, it's kind of a, a parallel or, or all possibility universe quantum world, 
you're always in all possible states where you could have been if you made the appropriate choice. So if I'm initially in state 0, deterministically, and I read a letter A, I branch out into being in state 1 following this edge and in state 0 simultaneously. Okay? And from then on, you always have to go, where could you end up from all the states where you currently are? There's no real quantum involved in this. It's all just um, saying you're in a set of states. And so you can um, read the text we had before. It's the same example if you want to go back um, at home. We're initially in state 0. After reading A, we're in states 0 and 1. After reading another A, if we're in state 0, we go to state 1. OK, we already had that. And we can also stay in state 0. If we're in state 1 and we read an A, huh, the automaton doesn't tell us um, where to go. That means that branch, that parallel universe, just collapses. It dies out because this is a dead end. OK? So if you're in states 0 or 1 and you read an A, you're afterwards still in states 0 and 1. If you're in, that, in these two states and read a B, it's a little more interesting. From state 0, B means you can stay in state 0. So you get that state 0. But you could have also been in state 1 and then read a B. That brings you to, one, to 2. So afterwards, you're in states 0 and 2. And then things get more wild. If you read another A from here, you can either be again in state 0 or in state 1 if you were in 0, or from 2 go to 3. So you can be in any of 0, 1, or 3, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, you found an occurrence whenever 7 is one of the possible states where you're currently in. That's the way to read this. And that's actually not a terrible way to think about string matching. It's just not such an efficient way. And we already know a somewhat OK way, the brute force method. And in a way, this one is essentially not much better. Uh, the point is that we have to maintain this set of states. And the worst case, it's the whole set. And then every transition needs to go through all the states you could be in. So you end up with essentially uh, this n times m worst case. Uh, very similar to the brute force method. OK, so was this all um, not useful? Ha! Ah, another piece of theory. For any non-deterministic finite automaton, you can, there's an algorithm to construct an equivalent deterministic finite automaton. Now, now we're getting closer. That algorithm is called the power set construction. Um, and it basically works by using, instead of the states we have, all possible sets of states as your states. So every state is a set of states from the previous automaton, and the transitions essentially work like in our example. OK. Um, and then there's even an algorithm to find a smallest possible DFA. So in a way, again, both of these problems are kind of solved. But uh, from a practical point of view, the concern is that the power set is an exponential blow up. Even if you can minimize the states away afterwards, that's really not helpful. We don't want to have an exponential blow up. And this is where, um, where we get to um, these, uh, these three names that will pop up later again. Um, somewhat independently, Knuth, Morris, and Pratt uh, came up with um, a few related ideas that help to avoid this exponential blow up. And the first of these ideas is that we don't have to go black box from NFA to DFA and then minimize it. We can build the automaton instead step by step. Uh, and if, if, you've, if you remember our example from before, uh, this was the string matching automaton I've shown you for our example pattern. How many states did it have? Well, just m, or m plus 1, uh, because the states had this specific meaning. Let's hope that this is general, and we always need just m plus 1 states, and not 2 to the m or something crazy like that. And they found, uh, they made the following observation. 
Um, which I guess is okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll go back to the um, example one more time. Um, maybe instead, let me just copy this. Then we have it a bit more. Um, Nicely drawn. So let's suppose we're trying to um, to find the transition from state three when reading uh, a letter A. So we're trying to trying to define trying to find this edge. But suppose we don't know where it goes yet. Now. The idea of Knuth Morris in practice, um, we add the next letter of the pattern one step at a time. So we assume inductively we've already built this part of the automaton. Everything that involves the first three states is known to us. Now, um, eh, I have to draw more pictures. Remember what it meant to be in this state Three, it meant there's our text, and then it meant that there were the first three characters of the pattern that we could read up until this point, and no longer prefix of the pattern was possible to read up to this point. And now the next letter that comes that is an A, which is not a B, which would be the next character in the pattern. And so we somehow have to shift the pattern a little bit further. And that is spelled out here, but let me show it in the example first. So um, the actual letters that go here are A, B, A. And we know they match the text. So the text ends with these three letters, A, B, A. And then comes another A. Now, uh, we know the, the automaton should now go to the state that tells us what's the, the longest prefix of the pattern we've seen if we read the A. And if we just figure this out uh, manually, we could try to shift it by one, but we see that's a mismatch with what we've seen from the text. So that doesn't match at all. If we shift it by two, that's a bit better, but it would still mismatch um, with this A here. I should probably draw it like this. So the best we can do is, is shift it all the way along so that only the A is aligned with the next letter that we're reading. So the state we should, we should go is state one. And of course, that's also what the automaton does. But how can the algorithm find this out using this green automaton without all this case by case and thinking through? Well, it can do it by pretending we're reading the text one more time. So we're reading what we know about the text, A, B, A, A, except that we leave out the first letter. Why do we do that? Because we already know that's, that's not matching. So um, we know the longest, the longest prefix that we can still find is definitely not four, it's at most three. So we just start reading with three. So we take BAA and look where the automaton A2 ends up after reading BAA. If we start in zero, we read a B, still in zero. We read a one to an A to go to one and we read another A, we're still in one. So that's, that's our result. Yeah. 
So here's you spell out in words again in general what this looks like. The new transition should still be according to the same invariant, the longest prefix that matches this. And um, that has to be a suffix of the pattern when I chop off the first character. So note here is uh, starts at one, here it starts at zero. And that's the, um, the state of the automaton that I've previously built when I start reading the text with the first character dropped. If you, if you try to do it exactly like that, it doesn't look like it's very efficient, but it turns out we can avoid that, but that's, that's still a useful way um, to build the automaton. Um, let's do one more example where we try to find delta of five and B. So when we're trying to find the transitions for state five, we know that C brings us to state six, that's the match edge. And for the other two transitions, for example, B, we have to look at what we already have. And the previous automaton we have is this part, A up to including four. Being in state five means we've seen the first five letters of the pattern. And the first five letters of the pattern are A, B, A, B, A. And now we're reading A, C, uh, sorry, B, and we drop the first character. So we look in the blue automaton, where do we end up when we read B, A, B, A, B? Start at zero, B, A, B, A, B, state four. And that's where we're supposed to end up. Okay, so manually that's, it's not a terrible way to build it for a small pattern. If the pattern gets very, very long and you do this exactly following the steps like this, you will naturally follow, lead to the algorithm that I'll show you next, which does this a little faster because you keep doing the same things. And to kind of give you a chance to see that in action, let's do um, the other transition for A. So again, we read in the blue automaton, but this time B, A, B, A, A. All right. We start in the beginning, we read B, A, B, A. And then instead of a B, we have an A, which brings us back to state one. Now you may have noticed that the paths for the green and the, and the blue parts, they all start with reading B, A, B, A. There's no need to simulate the automaton each time from scratch. Instead, I could have gone B, A, B, A. So I remember after reading B, A, B, A, I'm in state three. And then I can go one edge for B and another edge for A. All right? I'm always reading with the automaton the same prefix and then one letter at the end changes. That's only the last state that is different. All right. And that's the second insight of the three uh, of the three names, <laughs> the people behind the names, Knuth, Morris, and Pratt. The simulations of this smaller automaton only differ in the last step. So why don't we remember where we've been? And uh, you can push this one bit further with this algorithm by noticing if you go from one automaton building, okay, back to my example the last time. If you go from now constructing the transitions from state five to constructing those for state six, this blue automaton gets a little bigger. I add one more state, but I, I can also track that the prefix I read of the pattern also just gets one longer. So, when I was in state three before reading the last symbol because I read BABA -B -A in this blue automaton, once I go to the one bigger one, 
I add the B, A, B, A, C. So I go from state 3 to state 0, and that's the state where I start reading from. So it should say from state 6, whenever I read something that's not an A, that's the same as reading that from state 0. And that's indeed true because B and C stay in state 0. From state 6, B and C go to state 0. That means constructing the automaton here in the code as computing this transition function in an array uh, is very, very short and simple. I'll show you on, on the example. Uh, first of all, we initialize um, the first column to all zeros. But then we overwrite the match edge. So um, state 0 and the first character of the pattern A should instead go to state 1. That corresponds to the one matching edge that goes to the right. Now I maintain also this state x where I was when I read the one pattern, the pattern without the first character. And initially I'm in state 0. Now I go through all the, all the columns of the table. And the first step is I copy the column from, col from column x to the next column where I'm filling things in now. So my, my j is 1. I'm looking at this column. First step, just copy the previous column because that's where x is. But we overwrite the match edge. That's the only change we do. So we're in this, in this case, the match edge should be for b. So here we put a 2 to go to the next stage, the next uh, state, instead of staying where we are. And the last bit is update x. And uh, that means we're in the column of x and we read the next character of the pattern, which is b. So we're in this, we read a b, we stay in 0. So 0 is still correct. Let me go do it one more time. We copy the column 0, because that's where x is, 1, 0, 0. And we update the match edge. We should go from with an a to 3. That's that. Last bit, update the, uh, the edge here. So we're in state 0, and we read an a. That brings us to state 1. So x has now become 1. Next column, we start by copying, which is copying from column 1. Then we override for the match edge, which is a B, where we should now go to 4. And we update X. We're in state 1, we read a B, that brings us to state 2. All right, next one, 4, we copy from column X, 3, 0, 0. We update the match edge, uh, which is an A. So here we should go to 5. The rest stays as it is. And um, we update x. We're in state 2. And what we read is an a. So we go to state 3. All right. And one more time. We copy from state 3. 1, 4, 0. And we have a match edge for c. So here we go to state 6. Let's see if I did it correctly. Yeah, looks all right. <laughs> so if you want, you can draw the picture from this, right? The same diagram as we had before. Um, I didn't do it here. Well, I did it because I was, didn't do it because I was lazy to prepare it. But uh, I wanted to show the table because in this case, I think the table shows you much cleaner what happens than the messy arc diagram. And um, that's basically all. That's how you compute these uh, string matching automata. The code is super simple. Maybe digging through why it does the correct thing is uh, needs a bit of caffeine, maybe a look in the red book. Um, but once you code it up, it's very fast and very simple in terms of what happens computationally. That's the part I want to comment on briefly. Um, let's analyze how good string matching with the DFA is. 
I've already said before, when we have the automaton reading through the text once, it is just one table lookup for each text character. That's essentially as fast as you can get. I, don't, I, can't, I can hardly imagine speeding that up further. Building the uh, automaton, we still somehow have to fill the table. So even though um, visually it was copying a column and changing one entry, copying a column is still copying a column and writing every cell. Um, so we need theta of m times sigma time, just because that's the size of the output. The table is that big, m times sigma. So if you add that up, the total time for string matching becomes uh, m times sigma plus m. And also the space for the string matching automaton is the size of the table, essentially, and that's m times sigma. So that's very, very good for the matching time. If you build the pattern automaton once and use it many times, it's probably as good as it gets. But the space overhead can be big. Um, and in particular, uh, sigma in our examples will always be small because my slides are uh, very finite. But remember, uh, Unicode could be your character set. Uh, uh, I'll look this up this time. OK, that's from. October last year, it was just short of 150,000 characters. As I said before, all the useful emoji and all the scripts that humanity has ever imagined. Uh, so it could be big. Sigma could be quite a big number. Uh, Unicode is a standard for characters. It's the thing, how to encode text files these days. If, if something's called UTF-8, um, <laughs> what does UTF stand for? It stands for Unicode <laughs> format, I think. Transmission format. It's a standard. And it's one example where the alphabet is really big. If you take just the ASCII characters, the old Americans ignoring the rest of the world. It's technically 128 different characters, or uh, one byte if you grant them the extra one, 256, but it ignores all the other languages. Uh, then there have been various extensions, but Unicode is the solution since, I guess, this millennium, and it covers everywhere. Unicode is used, is used everywhere. Uh, definitely in Java. Uh, very low-level programming languages like C, C++ um, handle it differently. Let me put it simple. But you, they usually support it. In Java, every string is by standard UTF-16 encoded. Virtually all text files these days are UTF-8 encoded. And if they aren't, someone's doing a, a crime. <laughs> it's just a bad idea, uh, most of the time at least. Yep. My point here is, uh, is not so important. You can look it up. Um, the Wikipedia page is, um, is very useful on this. But my point was just sigma can be very big. Right, before we move on, let's do our short break. Um, again, I started a bit late, so let's. Uh, Push it out a bit further. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, have a look at the books if you want. Uh, so this one, let me check if I have it on the website actually. Just the most easy, like for what? Right? Really, for really what? Well. The question is for, for doing what? Algorithms is this one. No, it's it's more the notation uses it and the proofs use it. I mean, what what's discrete math, right? Um, I have some basic strings and trees and arguments on those. Yeah, but not math, math. What's math, math? <laughs> um, I don't know, like. 
I would say this probably falls in Pardon? notation. Yeah, the notations are, are probably the, the most prominent part because they always show up on the slides. Did you have a question about the class? Yeah. I'm wrong, but I don't understand what I'm wrong. Because it's, uh, the dominant functions are supposed to be these two. Yeah. And n by 2 plus 1 is obviously greater than n by 2. But, yes. But why is the answer equal? Well, because equal is not really equal. It means up to constant factors for sufficiently large n. Or in mathematical terms, if you take the limit of those two functions, that converges to neither zero nor infinite. So how are you supposed to compute in this case? Taking the limit of the functions. You can... Um, you can use Wolfram Alpha to do this, definitely for double checking. Uh, you don't have access to it during the exam, but still it's good to, to check. If you're, and there's, there's lots of YouTube tutorials for computing limits if you want to refresh that. Um, but if you just want to know the answer, take the two functions, divide them by each other, and ask Wolfram Alpha to compute the limit as n goes to infinity, and it'll do it. Especially for these kind of functions, there, um, it, it will definitely know how to do it. Well, again, remember what theta really means. It means you can both buy, bound the, on the left function by the right one and the other way around, but in the big O sense, namely uh, ignoring constant factors and small n. Sure. This regular expression, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think in programming language also we have some regular expression for string comparison. So if you use the same concept or there is some other algorithms. Yeah, it's very related. Um, most programming languages, people often distinguish regular expressions and rec axis. Yeah. Rec axis. So, are... Because programming languages use some extended constructs that are not really regular languages in the formal language sense. So they don't use this. And they, the they are more expressive and so they're slower. So, uh, and they, they still they use the automata fast. behind the you scenes. Can, can slide your DFA is faster than anything. DFA. Computing DFA is faster. So uh, then doing the string matching, if you if you're given the automaton, is faster if you're given the DFA. So, I, was, I was just thinking that uh, it's correct way. Is there a way by which uh, we can we can construct a tree and string uh, matching? Matching and searching are same, right? Uh, what what does searching mean? I mean, searching something to match it, and in searching right. also we are finding something, so that whether it's there or not. I mean, when people say searching, they usually think of a, a sorted list, something like binary search or a dictionary. Can I, can I, can I create a, something like a dictionary we have, right? So dictionary also, things are very much sorted. Like for A, whatever the word we need to go, we can go to A. Not to yeah, but the texts are not sorted, right? So I, I'm not sure what the, what the connection would be. Uh, tries are not wrong. Pardon? Tries. Two days back, I was solving one related to tries. So there we construct some tree, and based on that, we try to remember all the data. Yeah. Uh, let's maybe discuss after after this part. I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm getting the the connection. All right, guys, time to continue. <laughs> we have some time uh, after, after this part.
I definitely want to show this one, this one today because it, um, it nicely continues the, the story from before. Um, the key problem is, is actually the space usage of the string matching automata because uh, waiting a bit longer might be fine, but having even for small patterns this, this huge blow up of the alphabet size in the space is inconvenient. And string matching is so basic, it shouldn't be necessary. Uh, and indeed, it is not necessary. In the next section, we'll look at the knuth morse pratt algorithm, the same three names that popped up in the previous section by giving the key ideas to improve the construction of string matching automata. But the, the final solution that they came up with um, looks slightly different, and uh, it gets away without this sigma factor in the space for the string matching automaton. So if you recall, the string matching automaton as a DFA was essentially as fast as it could get for the matching part. But it needs this transition table, which tells you for each state and, and symbol where to go. And it just seems impossible to reduce that further, because you need to specify where to go. But uh, the simulation in the construction of the automaton looked very, very similar each time. We always had this error state x, and then we copied the entire column. That al already screams redundancy in your to, to, to you that you're copying these entire columns and then only change one entry. And so uh, the last insight is Mm, let's deviate slightly from this strict notion of a DFA and instead um, do something that works better with this notion that we just keep um, a previous state. And the solution for this, if you want to keep, keep drawing like the uh, nice images like this, um, is a failure link. So these, these are not automata in a normal sense. Instead, they have normal edges where you have to follow uh, a character if you can read it. But they also have these error links, which if you cannot follow a normal match edge, you have to take the error, the error link. But you don't consume the character. So if you're, if you're in state 5 and you read something that's not a C, say you read an A, then you would go via this error edge to state 3 and try again reading the same A. And in this case, again, you cannot really read the A, so you have to do another edge uh, following the error edge again. And you still try to read the same A, and it still doesn't work, so you still have to go the error edge one more, one more step. And in state 0, you finally can read your character A. That's different from our automata as we've seen them before. Uh, but this has the benefit that every state needs just a single error edge, a failure link. Now, it's, it's worth to point out the distinction to a non-deterministic finite automaton, because the, the computation is still deterministic. You have exactly one choice, what to do, uh, but you're not always using a, a character. If, if you've seen automata before, there's a notion of an epsilon transition in NFAs where you're allowed to take a transition without reading a character. But these are different. In this case, you either have to take the matching edge or you have to take the failure link. There's never any ambiguity of what to do. And here's for our famous example from before, um, ABABACA, uh, the failure link version. And let's first see how we um, use that to read through the text. But let me, let me do this quickly because it's um, similar to what we've done. Uh, we start in state 0, we read an A as the next character. Oh, we can do that. Perfect. Then we're done. Then we read a B in that state. Oh, OK, that also works. So we go to state 2. From 2, we read an A. That's the next character in the text. So we go to state 3. From state 3, a B brings us to state 4. 4a takes us to 5, but now from 5, there's no way to read the b. So instead, we go back to 3. And for 3, we can read a b. So here it brings us to state 4, and so on and so forth, OK? Um, 
use that uh, drawn nicely. And it can happen that in a certain state you have to follow failure links a few times before you can um, eventually read that character. That's just how these automata work. Okay. Wake up time. After uh, a long bit of, of just listening. It's not a trick question, but it's a question that needs a um, little second thought, maybe. Wait for a few more people. All right, um, let's see some, some spread of answers. <laughs> and uh, the majority got it, but it's a, it's a big spread. Um, now this is asking about the worst case. What's the worst case time to read a single character if we were using such an automaton? Uh, and the worst case as also often is realized if you have a very boring pattern. Say it's just A's, another one. I, I mean, you have to take my word for this, but you, you will find that the failure links always just go back one step in this case. And so if you're, if you're sitting in this state, say, and you read a B, then you'll have to bump down essentially M steps before you can read your read your B. The start state will always have um, all characters apart from the one that leads there will loop in state zero. That's why in the worst case it takes takes so much time. Now apart from just waking you up, that's also pointing out a potential problem, right? We loved our string matching automata because they gave a constant time per character in the text as the matching time. And now it seems like we messed this up. Now it could take um, essentially m time for each character in the text. So that sounds like we're back to n times m. Now fortunately that's not true. Uh, and the reason in this example maybe um, you can see why it can't be true. You can't always have to fall back all the way down the automaton. Uh, to be able to, to have this long path of an expensive character to read, you have to somehow make your way to the right first. And so whenever you have these long chains of uh, expensive reads that don't make progress, you had many cheap ones before. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. I didn't show you full code for the string matching automata, partly because nobody really uses those. Um, there's only fringe use cases. Whereas KMP is, a, is an algorithm that's um, uh, a bit more, bit more widely used. Um, in practice, sometimes Boyer more beats it. So uh, that's the second one we'll come to, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. For, for KMP, I wanted to give you full code. And so here it is. There's a first part that we haven't talked about yet. That'll be the next slide. 
We have to compute the failure links, similar to how we computed the automaton before. Um, and the rest of the code explains the matching step. And I'll run through it very quickly because it's what we've seen in the example. We maintain a position in the text and the current state in this automaton, the KMP automaton with failure links. We go through all positions in the text one by one. Um, then we check if we can take the match edge. If so, we advance to the next state. So we make Q one bigger and we go to the next symbol in the text. If that by we reach the end of the pattern, we found our match and we can return that. And remember, we only find out when, once we've read the entire pattern. So we have to subtract the length of the pattern again to get the starting position. String matching was supposed to return the index of the first character of the match, uh, somewhat arbitrarily. Otherwise, so if we can't take the match edge, we have to follow failure links until we can. And so um, unless we're already in state zero, we update our state to the failure link, jumping back to the left. And uh, so we do this, and then we go back to the while loop. So we, we just start uh, trying in the, in the new state again. OK. In terms of space, we only uh, look like we don't, we don't really represent the automaton anymore at all. Uh, I could draw this picture, but there's only two types of edges, those that are match edges, and I can compute those from the pattern on the fly, or the failure links, and that's a single number for each state. So that's just one array. That's why we just have this. Uh, and let's quickly analyze this, because the question pointed out, some of the characters in the text might need m time to read them, potentially dangerous. But fortunately, it's not a problem. Um, there's two cases of what can happen. So um, we'll bound the overall number of iterations of this while loop. Because inside, if you look at what happens, there's a few if, then else, and so on. But there's no further loops. So the whole inner loop part from here to here, I want it done in black. That's all just constant time. We're not doing anything cons uh, more costly in there. So the, the only thing that counts is how often do we have this outer repetition of the loop. And so there's, there's these two options. We can either make progress in the text, which means i goes, gets closer to n, which eventually means we're, we're running out of characters in the text. And that happens here and here. Or we shift the pattern forward. And that's a little more subtle. It doesn't necessarily move i. Right? It could, could keep i where it is. Um, but we still um, shift the pattern forward whenever we update q. So we have either steps that increase i or steps that increase i minus q. OK. And in this case, we use that fail is always strictly less than its argument. So when we're in this case, we make q strictly smaller, and that makes i minus q strictly bigger. So in total, we can have at most n of these steps where i gets bigger i never gets smaller. And it starts at 0, and it is at most n. So we can have at most n steps like this. And similarly, this term i minus q, uh, it starts at 0. It goes up to essentially at most n. 
and it's incremented by um, at least one whenever we have the green part. So we can have at most n steps of this as well. So in total, we're doing at most two n symbol comparisons, where the, the comparison that we pay for is, is always at this step. OK? That's, that's the trick in this case. You can't analyze the loop in isolation, but there's, there's these two different paths it can take. And both of these each can only happen n times. So in, in total, there can only be two n of them in uh, at most. What's missing is computing the failure links. And uh, for that, we'll do something very, very analogous to the DFA construction. And indeed, it turns out we've already done everything back then that we needed. It's just that instead of copying columns, we just remember that state x. That failure state that we went to, where we took the column and copied it, that's exactly uh, the state, uh, the target of the failure link. So here's the code for that spelled out. Um, we start initially with uh, setting the failure link to 0. Failure state is also 0. Um, and we don't have to do the match edge, so we skip that part. We just set um, the next entry to x, and then we update x, which means we now have to use the failure link automaton um, to uh, update x to the next step. So if x is currently 3, then we have to set it to where it was if we read a b. And so while the, the next character that we see is not the next character we have to read, um, we again follow a failure link. And uh, this, this minus 1 is just because we update x, increment x here anyways. So that's a, a boundary case for the 0. It's the very same, very same idea as we did for in more detail for the DFA construction. Now again, um, we want this to be efficient. And uh, now we have two nested loops. We have an outer loop that runs m times, and we have an inner loop that could potentially run m times. So uh, it could be, if you just look at this, maybe it could be quadratic in m. But it turns out it's not actually like that, with a, a very similar argument as before. The outer loop is at most m times, uh, but then the inner loop always makes x at least one smaller. Remember, fail of x is strictly less than x. So x becomes one smaller here, but it's only incremented once here. So every iteration of the inner loop makes x one smaller, but it can't go below 0, and it's only incremented by 1 for each iteration of the outer loop. So that means the inner loop has at most m iterations in total, because x starts at 0. It can never go beyond m. And each of these uh, iterations of the inner loop consumes 1 from x. So you have m iterations of the inner loop, m iterations of the outer loop, um, and 2m simple comparisons, again, from, from this part at most. If you, feel, if you find this looks very similar to the code before, then wait for the tutorial where, where you will explore the similarity between those two between those two algorithms, between this one for using the failure link automaton for string matching, and this one for computing the failure links. They're indeed uh, intimately related. For the overall string matching, we have to do both. We first have to compute the failure links. That takes 2m character comparisons at most. And then we have to do the simulation of the automaton reading the text. That's at most 2n character comparisons. So in total, we have time dominated by n plus m, big O of n plus m time. And that, for the first time, is um, essentially the best possible time. 
Because if we were supposed to find all occurrences of the pattern in the text, we at least have to be allowed to read the pattern and the text once. And that already gives you that time. So Knuth Moore's Pratt, the algorithm has optimal worst case complexity, which also means the other complexities are, are sandwiched between the, the lower bound in the worst case and this. Um, and the space usage is at least reduced to what we need to store the pattern. That's also um, hard to imagine how you can do much better. Uh, let's have a look uh, at how much you digested this, either from now or from something before this. This is supposed to be more of a question to reflect on what we talked about. And you're, you have all the information you need for answering this. So I'll, I'll give you a, a minute or two to think about it. Can we get to 90? We started out with 128. So we got to 90. Does that mean I should reveal the answers now? Uh, OK, maybe we can get 100. Well, I'll slowly start. 3, 2, and we have 100. 1, goodie. <laughs> So there's some controversial answers, and um, let me let me discuss a bit um, what I had in mind here. Uh, some of some parts of this question may be a bit vague, so don't get don't get too uh, too frustrated if if what you voted doesn't match my uh, my marking here. Uh, the first part: faster pre-processing on the pattern. I think that's a pretty clear one because the DFA had this factor sigma. Unless sigma is really small, uh, the pre-processing on the pattern goes down from m times sigma to essentially big O of m. Uh, and that will almost always be faster, uh, even if sigma is not, not enormous. Um, the matching part, once I've built the automaton or the uh, uh, the virtual realization of the automaton in the KMP algorithm, the matching itself is probably faster with the DFA. Uh, maybe something one can discuss, but uh, by and large, it's faster because it doesn't have this factor two. Uh, KMP had overall order n plus m time complexity and this 2m as an upper bound of the symbol comparisons, but the string matching automaton is basically a factor one. It uses table lookup, not comparisons, but it, it will be similar in, in time. So actually, the string matching automaton wins on this part. But it's, uh, it's bought with much more space. So KMP uses less space because we're losing the factor sigma. That was the whole point that um, I mentioned at the beginning. And that also means it makes the running time independent of sigma, which 
is maybe somewhat surprising, right? It doesn't matter how many different characters there are in the pattern or the text. Uh, maybe that sounds uh, dubious at first, but remember all we're doing is symbol comparisons. So as long as it takes constant time to take two characters and tell you are they equal or not, uh, it's actually no contradiction here. I skipped this one, um, fewer character comparisons. Uh, <laughs> that's a bit of a cheat because the string matching automaton doesn't really use character comparisons. Uh, yeah. Uh, you could also say um, accesses to the characters. The string matching automaton probably still wins, at least for the matching part, because it accesses each text character at most once. Um, the KMP algorithm might, um, might have to access the same character several times. At most two on average, but is a factor two again. Right. And OK, <laughs> whatever. Depends on your liking. Uh, one, one last part that belongs into the KMP section is um, a remark that this prefix function, the, the failure links, this uh, fail array, where is it here, is actually much more versatile than just doing what we've done, string matching with it. In a sense, it, it seems to capture some self-similarity in the pattern that has found it was found to be useful in many other contexts. And that also means that people gave it slightly different names and slightly different conventions before it was uh, formalized in, in this version. And so <laughs> if you read about this in other books, it can be a bit confusing because they use slightly different uh, notation. So the, the typical thing you find is the KMP prefix function or Knuth's prefix function or slightly uh, different names for that, often denoted as F. Um, and you can remember that F is essentially the same as fail. It's just a shift by one in the index. Uh, so the definition that people would, would give for the prefix function is f of j is the length of the longest prefix of the prefix of the pattern ending at index j. That is also a suffix of that thing if you chop off the first character. So again, in pictures, here's our entire pattern. Here's position 0 up to j. So f of j is the length of the longest prefix. So we have some shifted version of this. That's p again, shifted. The length of the longest prefix that matches here. And I guess mismatches after, and there's no shorter way. So that is f of j. Right, and uh, that's very similar to how we defined the string matching transitions. So there's no, it's no surprise that this is the same as fail apart from renaming things. So the difference for us, fail of j would have been excluding that position j, otherwise it's the same. So that also means um, it, it's useful to memorize, memorize this alternative definition of the failure links. Fail of j is the length of the longest prefix of the first j characters of the pattern. That is also a suffix of that thing if we chop off the first character. And again, the, the prefix suffix thing is just a, a, a convoluted way to say what the picture says. This whole thing is a prefix of the pattern. Uh, now we take another prefix of the pattern and it should be a suffix of that prefix. Uh, Untangling the words in pictures usually makes it easier. But it's, it's probably good to memorize this and untangle it when you need it on the spot. So this, this will crop up in, in other uh, efficient string algorithms, um, often under the name of prefix function, so I wanted you to know about it. That's all about KMP. 
what's left from this unit are the two uh, optional things that a slight majority voted to see, um, but I guess not today. So we'll, we'll start with those tomorrow. I'll try to be not too slow on them because uh, they're not in the exam material. Uh, I, I decided to kick them out because we have a lot of material anyways in the module. And I always struggle to make good exam questions out of that two sections. Yeah, so off, off you go. But more seriously, they're, they're a nice additional thing, well covered in the red book, but they don't add to the module otherwise. We don't build on them later. Good. Um, there were more questions. Um, if people have to leave, that's fine. I think there were one or two that I wanted to uh, comment on. Uh, one question was about the um, past exam papers. Uh, please speak to the student experience team and remind them or ask them when the ones from last year are coming. If they tell you, oh, the module coordinator didn't allow us to use it, then uh, maybe tell them to get in touch. I don't think I did, but uh, there's maybe a chance that this was miscommunicated. Um, yeah, so they're centrally administered, and they always put a few out there. Uh, so you should, should be able to get this. Also on this, um, I'm just finishing this, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you when, once it's ready. I usually do a, a mock exam just for you to see what it looks like uh, with a few past exam problems uh, on top of the, the exam, past exam paper from last year, where you see exactly the structure of the exam and what type of questions have been on this in the past. You won't get the same, but in the same style. Uh, so that's, that's the other thing that I'll do. Uh, so you should have at least two type, two half papers or so that um, are uh, with the same style as, as I teach it now. There's one past paper from many years ago where a few topics are different and the style of the exam might be slightly different. Uh, it's fine if you do the assessment on paper and just submit the cue in the code. If you want more details, ping me again. I think I've commented on this in the past. Um, I'll, I'll look at those again. Um, maybe I'll, I'll keep the question. Yeah, I wanted to comment on this one. So uh, I think it's a uh, 100,000, but doesn't matter. For the Panda assignment, the goal should really be to have a simple solution, which means a short queue, not something where you fill, uh, fill it with millions of times. Uh, I think if you don't find anything else, then that is kind of um, a cheaty way to do it. You, you produce a queue that has 100,000 entries and you checked in our code that we only simulated for 100,000, so you kind of get away with it. Uh, I'll probably allow it, but there is um, a secondary marking criterion for simplicity of the solution where you get a slight deduction if that's, if that's the part. Uh, but depending on how you produce the solution, I think that might be acceptable. Uh, it just is easier sometimes. Uh, but I mean, the goal would be to have a short queue that you keep repeating, uh, whatever short means. Probably not 100,000, but it might mean 1,000 sometimes for some of the problems. For most of them, much less. Um, yeah, so, sorry I missed that. Maybe. Uh, Maybe catch me. If, if you watch the recording and it doesn't get clear, maybe I ask again and I'll uh, explain it and maybe in text again. Yeah, it's 100,000. Maybe I'll, I'll rank, yank it up to 10 million just to uh, make, um, make it more painful. Um, it, it's both. So the primary marking criterion is the efficiency of the solution, so the guaranteed harvest. Um, but we also have this secondary criterion. So if, if you produce a solution that's better than everybody else's and it's much longer, then you still win because you get a better solution. If other people found a similar guaranteed harvest, but with a much simpler queue, then you get a slight deduction. But it won't be too much. Uh, I don't want to limit you in the space of ideas to explore, but the intention was to have relatively short queues. Okay, goodies, see you in a few hours. <laughs>